Uh, good morning, sir, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen and guests. Uh, I'd like to firstly echo the sentiments of the previous speakers and say thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak today. And additionally, <coughs> for the opportunity to allow a JTAC to do what they do and what they enjoy the most, which is talk about themselves for the next 20 minutes. Integration is defined as to form, coordinate or blend into a functioning unified whole. And joint terminal attack controllers are the ADF and specifically Army's experts within the uh, tactical integration of air power to support our ground forces. The immediate and near future is going to continue to likely see those small forces who are tasked organised and will definitely include these specialists. Moreover, it will be these teams of specialists that tactically blend air power and strategy, emerging technologies tactic techniques and, and uh, procedures into the ground fight in order to enable the joint operations. The current dominant narrative and rhetoric within inside the Australian Defence Force with CAS and the F-35 is that it will not do it. Um, it, may, it will not do it due to uh, numerous factors and we'll explore some of these and challenge that perception later. However, the fact is that the F-35 does do CAS and it does do it extremely well. Because of that, the JTACs are the key currently within the land domain into that joint space, and we'll explore some of that later. Before I go into the scope of the presentation, I'd like you to draw your attention to the quote. Now, that quote was from uh, Lieutenant General Mike Lundy, who opened his address to the Joint Pfizer Executive Steering Committee to essentially challenge their perceptions also that the F-35 and fifth generation aircraft he wants to challenge that perception that it is not that one trick air to air pony, it is not that stealth fighter, that it is a platform that is able to bring with it a myriad of sensors that will increase the lethality and effectiveness of all operations. So for this scope of the lesson, uh, this lesson, sorry, that's the RMC instructor in me at the moment. For the scope of this presentation, I'm going to briefly talk through uh, the history of the capability and then how it's evolved with the current operational trends. We'll then go through how are JTAC's raised and then talk through some of the key challenges that we're currently facing with the capability. I'll then look to pivot to the F-35 capability, look at some of the emerging technologies that are coming within the next five years, almost, five to ten years, and then link to uh, both some fixes and potentially looking at what the fifth generation JTAC will look like. So a bit of history. JTAC is not a new qualification or skill set, it's just a new name for that person is qualified in, and uh, trained to integrate that air power in close proximity to friendly forces as we've spoken about. The, whilst the uh, capability has uh, been around for a, a, a significant amount of time from World War I, we've had our pathfinders, our air spotters, then moving to Vietnam and Korea with forward air controllers, both ground and air, and also with our air combat officers. The key difference with the JTAC nowadays is that the JTAC can take that tactical ownership of that airspace directly above the ground fight. That affords us a lot of opportunities now to integrate and effectively employ growth, uh, both the air power and air munitions with our surface, surface fires and even naval to surface fires also in support of the land domain and influencing the joint. In 2006, Australia was the first signatory to the uh, US uh, memorandum, memorandum of Agreement for the employment of jo uh, Joint Terminal Attack Controllers, training and employment. Uh, since then, Australia is also only one of three countries to sign the MOAs for both the Joint Fires Observer and the Forward Air Controller airborne elements. What that essentially means is, as we talk about that systems of systems, we now have the doctrine and the qualified professionals that are able to exploit that coalition, common tactical doctrine to enable tactics, techniques and procedures to employ and gain access to coalition weapon systems that interoperability. Since the first course was raised with the signing of the MOA, Australia's changed, uh, trained 471 JTACs. Of that 471 JTACs, currently only 38 are still in the system. Now that we've looked to where the capability came from, we'll now speak to how it's evolved. The JTAC capability as a whole has significantly changed over the last years of employment of operations. Since the first Australian JTACs were trained, they have constantly been employed in operations supporting the ground fight, employing both lethal 
non-lethal, kinetic and non-kinetic effects. We've seen close air support change significantly from the uh, original days of the opening fight in Afghanistan. We've shifted from what we termed as a Type 1 control, where the JTAC on the ground had to visually acquire the aircraft on its ingress, assess its geometry, identify the target, before giving the weapons release call of cleared hot. Now, with the proliferation of UAVs, the networking on the battle space, excuse me, the networking of the battle space and the ability to access tactical data networks, we're seeing a shift from those type one controls, those very constrictive controls, into those type two controls. These type two controls are now, they afford us the ability to dislocate ourselves physically potentially from that direct fight, enable to support a, a host nation force or potentially a local national force from a rearward area potentially in a tactical headquarters, which is enabled with those ISR elements, that all we need to do now is identify the target somehow through a system, either using a ground observer on the ground or a UAV itself. From there, with these TTPs that we've signed up to from the mem member of understanding, uh, correction, the member of agreement, that we are able to employ these we new weapon systems in support of those ground troops by giving, we don't necessarily need to see the target at this time. Now this is currently happening in Afghanistan, Iraq and even to a point uh, in the Philippines where Australia deployed JTACs to assist them in their uh, integration of that airspace. So with this shift we've seen a significant change in the perception of close air support within inside the ADF. The close, we're no longer doing close air support is a pretty common narrative because the, we've been removed from the fight, we're now sitting in a talk and then the forward forces are currently the ones doing the fight. I want to challenge this perception and base this by looking back onto the authoritative document for our close air support, which is the US Joint Publication 309 bar 3. And it states that close air support is an air action by fixed and rotary wing aircraft against hostile targets that are in close proximity to our friendly forces that require detailed integration of the fire movement of those forces for each air mission. Okay? Now, if you look at that force, whilst we might not be employing those weapons and effects, directly in support of our coalition troops on the ground, we are still employing them in support of those host nations. And current ROE and targeting directives push those host nationals inside that category of friendlies, which actually enables us and gives us the opportunity as a coalition, as a joint space, to have that kinetic effect on the ground to support host nation. Now that we've talked about uh, how the capability has evolved and where it began, I'll now look to how we raise a JTAC and talk to some of the challenges we're currently facing. So the JTAC course overview, as it states there, is run twice a year by four a squadron uh, RAAF. The panels generally sees 12 to 16 students, the breakdown as you can see. Uh, it's a six week course with four week academic with a breakdown of uh, live and dry simulations in the academic phase before we move into the LFX and certification phase. When we move into the LSX phase, we can see that that's the standard ordinance that we look to employ on a course. Now, I'd like you to draw your attention to that amount of ordinance that we look to employ on the course, as that's going to be a uh, factor when we talk about the F-35's employment. The average controls per student is actually quite high. Uh, it's higher than the average controls for the, all the countries that are currently signed up under the, the MOA. Our failure rate has significantly dropped. So previously it used to be sitting around that 20, 30%. However, due to uh, four squadrons good work in taking ownership of that course, we've now seen that drop. Now post the, we've got that 10% there as a non-combat ready and I'll explain what that is now. Is that post the end of this course, once a JTAC student is deemed evaluated and certified under the MOA, Australia then trains, we take the ownership of that uh, capability, that that is now combat ready. So what that means is that I as a JTAC student have been deemed certified and ready that then the very next day I can deploy to the Middle East of Air Operations to employ air power in support of both lethal kinetic, non-kinetic and non-lethal effects in support of operations. So. If that's the course, once we do that immediate course, we now need to maintain that currency. This is our current currency requirements under the MOA. And as you can see right there, it's a fair amount. However, with the new MOA that was signed in 2014, it's given us a lot more opportunities with regards to how we employ and, and uh, the ability for us to mesh these controls together to achieve that currency. Another thing uh, the new MOA updated was that we are now able to simulate a lot of these controls. 
However, point to note with the simulation is that simulation needs to be an accredited simulator, of which the LAN 17 has now uh, released and put in place the new dome simulators, of which that is the Joint Fires accredited simulator. However, whilst that has released some of the burden of uh, both ACG and air support assets to support the training of the JTACs and JFOs, of note, we can only do one of those every six months. So therefore, if I do a type two control with a bomb on coordinate, with a laser pointer or a remote observer, and I do that all simulated, the next six month period where I go for recurrency, that has to be live. So with this currency requirements, under the current construct of where the capability sits, that is all we need to achieve. There is no proficiency training, it is all just focused on currency. So right now as a JTAC, all I have to do is meet these minimum requirements every six months, and I'm good to go. Which leads me into one of the key challenges that we're currently facing. Now at RMC yes oh sorry, feedback. Okay, at RMC yesterday we had the Chief of Army come to speak to us, and my SA up there is probably gonna laugh at me because I'm about to read something that she knows I just read yesterday. All right, so in the Chief of Army's um, Army in Motion brief and then spoke to us about it, he talks to preparedness. In preparedness, he states that preparedness is dynamic. It requires us to both be prepared ready now, whilst concurrently being prepared and ready for the future. Which leads me on to my first point and the first challenge we're currently facing is, and the biggest of everything, uh, Christian, big of all the challenges, is that currency versus training. Is what are we doing? Are we trying to just maintain currency or are we trying to move forward into a training army? Now one of the key uh, constraints that's coming into this and a, a big factor that's, that's coming to play is that ACG is losing its ability to support both JTAC course and proficiency training. Now this is, pretty, uh, fa this is fair to understand that the F-35 and for ACG to be able to uh, bring the F-35 into capability in IC and FOC, they have to bring offline the, uh, the classic Hornet squadrons. So current, uh, for the last currency training that was conducted, it was done by 75 squadron. However, of note, some of their pilots are also over there conducting um, the conversion on the F-35. So we are losing that ACG support. Now, we're now starting to see the, some multiple factors which we'll talk through, the Swiss cheese effect of the line starting to hold up, where the JTAC course that was run the first course at the start of this year uh, did not receive any uh, F-18 support, and therefore the only air support they were able to utilise for the conduct of the training was the PC-9 and the Hawks. Whilst these are good platforms to use in that training environment, when we go to the certification phase, these JTACs that were trained at the start of the year had not seen HE weapons employed until this last currency. Now, if we're talking about developing a professional, um, a professional proficient JTAC or joint fires person who is able to integrate effects, they must understand those effects. So we're sort of starting to see the holes uh, line up in the Swiss cheese. Linking on to that is that currently the F-35, as we'll talk through later with the uh, capability realisation plan, and the F-35 as a whole under the block, uh, currently block two moving to block three and block four, uh, upgrades is that it's not scheduled to release uh, those dumb bombs or unguided munitions. Right, what that means now is that when it comes into uh, IAC and before FOC, when it, the F-35 starts to look to be employed on JTAC course, we're going to see the uh, cost of both the air hours and the munitions that it's going to employ increase significantly. So anticipating that, we're probably going to look to see that we're going to lose a lot more air uh, support and bombs and we need to be smarter in how we train our JTACs. Also, uh, the PC-9 that we currently are able to use with the smoke bombs underneath it to meet that live currency, uh, both in the certification and then currency and proficiency training, the new PC-21 can't release at the moment or mount um, those smoke grenades. Now, whilst it allows with force run, they said that there's currently um, contractual negotiations ongoing and that they are hopeful. However, that's currently where it sits right now. So those, two, those three factors alone are looking that we need to have an ADF solution. Now there are solutions available with contracted air solutions, for example AlphaJet, uh, AlphaJet solutions contracts air CAS which are able to support training and we've just seen the first successful um, occurrence of that with one brigade in support of forces command training. However we still don't, we're still not able to tick that live box. Now we've looked at the ACG support to that and we've got a couple of other, with some more frictions. So I want to draw to everyone's attention to the fact that post this course and post the initial currency, there is no graduated, uh, there is no graduated training program. It's all left up to the individual unit coordinators inside that AO. 
What that then means is it's a wholly and solely dependent onto the level of JTAC that the, the individual wants to go to. There is no, uh, it is not linked to any of the Army Learning, uh, the ATLS, the Army Learning Training Standards. Therefore, all we essentially have to do is continue to meet that currency and then we're deemed proficient, which is not necessarily the case if we're looking to bring into service a lot of these merging technologies. Also, there's no management cell. So once we finish that initial course, there is no management cell uh, of JTACs with inside Army because it's only a specialist skill set, not a trade. Therefore, what we're seeing is, is that currently we've got, uh, this is the 38 JTACs that we talk about, currently still in service. Right? Of that 38 JTACs, there's only 21 that are in role. Of that 21, if we remove the top six that are currently sitting in JTAC troop, supporting that training, um, we've only got 11 inside all three combat brigades. Of that 11, at the end of this year, we're about to lose four of those JTACs out of that combat brigade to go out of role. Out of role is someone like myself who has done training and is now out of role in an instructional position or something else, which is going to likely see us incredibly short of, of uh, JTACs in that combat brigade. So now that we've spoken to some of those challenges, I want to pivot to that uh, the fifth generation fighter. Now the fifth generation fighter and the F-35 subsistently, it 100% can do CAS, it does it very well. The, we'll speak to some of the examples uh, a bit further on. However, the United States Air Force and US Marine Corps are using the F-35 in that CAS role, just a normal CAS stack, but it's mainly using those, uh, the guided weapon roles. That uh, version there of the F-35 is the Block 3 upgrade, and as you can see with those external pylons, it is able to uh, bring a fair amount of new weapon systems to the fight. To evidence this further, we've got, uh, this is the Bravo's block with the US Marine Corps, where they're currently, this is the standard JCAS check-in or the Joint Close Air Support check-in for this aircraft. Now this is all to the level now where it's just procedural, it's all procedural. Um, as you can see here as well, that's the block three upgrade, and then once we move into block four, it'll open up uh, all these other weapon systems, and we'll go through one of those uh, very shortly, being the small diameter bomb two. Now, the F-35 is an incredibly long range and all weather capable, as it says, with regards to all those sensors. Now, these sensors, whilst uh, none of them are really new, but one platform having them all together is, is, a, uh, is a very significant leap forward. Now, to me as a JTAC, I see this as an opportunity to employ these systems and integrate them with both the ground and joint fight. Also, I see this as an opportunity to identify training to get experienced in that platform so that when then we can link back into the joint fight. When we link the F-35's capability to access tactical data links and its sensors, and we then look to the future of uh, where we can see our joint terminal attack controllers or ground controllers going, we've currently got in service the DTCS, but we're about to, uh, well, sorry, we're not about to, but this is uh, currently the miniaturization of technology, which is Link 16. So everyone's seen Link 16 previously, it was these massive computers that previously everyone would be like, there's no way that a JTAC's even going to carry that, or uh, any other ground controller. That essentially the same size as a 152 and allows us access into that tactical data link that's Link 16. This is going to shape us into a massive step forward into our digital aided close air support, which will give us the ability to share data over the horizon to the Link 16 network back up and out. When we couple that with the emerging technologies of the small diameter bomb 2, which Australia has signed up and will be purchasing, and its ability, we're sacrificing the, uh, some of the bang for the lethality and the accuracy that is the, F uh, the SDB 53, the Tri-Seeker tri Warhead fuses multiple technologies into the one bomb. This bomb can now, when coupled with the SAR radar, is able to identify track targets and engage through cloud. As we spoke about previously, that system of systems, we now got the opportunity to exploit that even further and have the ground controller element that's sitting alongside those ground forces and fully enable the integration of these new systems and assets through these tactical data links. Now, I was always told by my bosses to always come with fixes, not just, not just problems. So some of the quick fixes that we need to look at is we need to start looking at a representative in, the, in each forces command or, or, or grouping. So RAF, SO command and force command need to have some sort of management cell to both manage the JTACs and then create that training in order to get proficiency. We need to incentivise our junior JTACs in order to potentially mitigate the lack of or the uh, issues and challenges we're seeing with that air support and ACG monitoring their priorities. 
We need to start capitalising on that overseas training opportunities and learning our lessons from our coalition partners who are currently uh, using the assets and employing these systems both overseas on operations and in training. So just in conclusion, uh, the JTAC capability is armies, tactical integration experts, and they are able to, on the ground right now, employ that air power and support of troops. Now the Chief of Army was very, very, uh, he mentioned it about five or six times yesterday, that he really wants to start, the previous perception of Army was that the Joint is there to support the Army. This new Chief of Army, that is not his, that is not the way he sees it. It is now Army's opportunity for Army to give back to Joint, and JTACs are currently formed at and poised ready to do that right now. The real weapon of the current JTACs is those authorities and the access to the coalition air assets and the interoperability that Sir spoke about earlier. For example, um, a JTAC on the last ex uh, one of the last exercises was able to employ a pair of B1Bs that flew out of Guam and employed 16,000 pounds of bombs in 45 seconds, just using TTPs and doctrine and the uh, tactical data links that we spoke about. Additionally, the F-35 is expected to conduct CAS. It is identified, and that's that's identified in the capability realisation plan for the F-35, where not only does it need to, and it will be releasing air to service munitions before it's signed off as IAC next year, but the capability realisation plan needs and will be assessed against its ability to provide uh, OAS or offensive air support, being CAS and strike, and the F-35 will look to a support, uh, close air support training and JTAC training before 2020. And as we said, we've got that fifth generation fighter. We now need to say, we need to make and prepare for and shape for and future proof both Army and Joint with that fifth generation JTAC. And I think uh, Chris is about to push me off the stage if anyone's got any questions.